Those of you that have been here many times before, you'll know about what I'm about to do is one of the most impossible tasks I can do. I'm going to cover two chapters in about 25 minutes. I know you think it's impossible, but you watch and see. I think it'll happen. We'll see. I'm not going to take any wagers on it, but I will do the best I can. If you've found your place in 1 Samuel chapter 5, follow along with me while I read. And the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer unto Ashdod. Now, let me just give just a little bit of history. In our chapters, what we found is now Israel has a prophet. Samuel has taken his position. The priesthood has been destroyed, and now uh, we're moving forward. Things seem to be going great. The children of God now have taken on a battle with the Philistines. And as they did, uh, we find that they ran into a little difficulty. The first battle, they lost. And so they go back and they said, what do we do? How can we win the battle? Well, instead of consulting with God, they said, let's just take the ark of God with us because the ark of God surely will give us uh, a victory. Well, they take the ark of God, which is the, the ark of the covenant. They take it and they take it in the battle with them. Well, guess what happens? The Philistines take not only defeat them, but then takes the ark. Now, this was a surprise to them because they surely thought God wouldn't allow that to happen, but God did, and there was a reason. But they had put their trust in that piece of furniture instead of the one true God. The Philistines now have the ark, and so this is where we pick up the story. Verse 2 says, And the Philistines took the ark of God, they brought into the house of Dagon, and set it by Dagon. Dagon is their false god. It was a stone figure that they had that they worshipped. And when they of Ashdod arose early on the morrow, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face in the earth before the ark of the Lord. And they took Dagon and set him in his place again. That's kind of funny. Isn't it kind of funny? I, I, I find that very kind of humorous. I mean, you think about it, you know, put the ark in there and their God's standing there. And they come back the next morning and their God's on his face before the ark, worshiping the ark, basically, if a stone could worship an ark. So... I don't know, I think that's kind of cool. Verse 4 says, And when they arose early on the morning, the morrow morning, this is the second time, behold, Dagon was fallen upon his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both his palms of his hand were cut off upon the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. Therefore neither the priest of Dagon nor any that came into Dagon's house tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod unto this day. But the hand of the Lord was heavy upon them in Ash, of Ashdod, and he destroyed them and smote them with emeralds and Ashdod and the coast thereof. And when the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, The ark of God of Israel shall not abide with us, for his hand is sore upon us and upon Dagon our God. And they sent therefore and gathered all the lords of the Philistines unto them and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? And they answered, Let the ark of God of Israel be carried about unto Gath. And they carried the ark of God of Israel about thither. In other words, get that thing out of here. We don't want it around. Things is causing problems. Verse 9, And it was so that after they had carried it about, the hand of the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. And he smote the men of the city, both small and great, and they had emeralds in their secret parts. Oh, my goodness. Therefore, they sent the ark of God to Ekron. And it came to pass, as the ark of God came to Ekron, that the Ekronites cried out, saying, They have brought about the ark of God of Israel to us to slay us, our people. Their own people had brought this to kill them. So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of God of Israel and let it go again to its own place, that it slay us not and our people. For there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of the God was very heavy there. And the men that died not were smitten with emeralds, and the cry of the city went up to heaven." Now, Ben, I'm going to cover so much ground, I'm not going to go into every little detail. But you've got the story, and you need to understand that. Now, as I read that, I think it's interesting, because here they bring this, this, this religious piece of furniture that came from Israel. And think about this. They, as Philistines, they didn't recognize its importance. They, they just thought, this is what Israel thinks is important, and now we've captured it. So we can, we can now do with it what we want to. And so they did. And they decided, let's just put it with our other religious artifacts. They had a, they had a god 
uh, Dagon, and so let's just put it with our other god. Now, what's interesting, when they put it with the other god, the god falls down. And it's kind of interesting to me, because when I think about it, here's this piece of rock, and the, 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 uh, the Ark of the Covenant sitting there, and the Ark of the Covenant, God comes and he says, you know what, <laughs> uh, get out of the way, and he fa- falls down in front of him. Well, they come in and they pick him up and they set him back up. And they said, oh, I'm so sorry you fell down, God. Let's put you right back where you belong. And you don't have to fall anymore because you've fallen and couldn't get up. (laughs) He's a do-nothing God. I mean, literally, he was a do-nothing God. In front of the holy living God. Amen? That was the problem. Well, when he falls the next day, they come back and his head is missing, his hands are missing. And they put him back. They put that stump of a God back up and they take the ark of God and bring it out and say, let's get rid of this thing because we don't need it around. It's causing too much trouble. Well, as I began to think about that, I thought about, I thought about us. I thought about the American church. I thought about people today. And you know what is true? People today treat God the same way. They put him alongside their other gods Oh, he's God. Yeah, we recognize him as God, but we put him in here with our other gods. You see, see there's so many other gods we have. God is anything that takes the place of God. Amen? I, uh, I, I think some, some of the strangest looking gods I've ever seen. Have you, have you noticed them? Some people's gods look like motorhomes. Have you seen some of those gods? Oh, boy, y'all going to get quiet on me. Okay, well, go ahead and get quiet. I'm going to go right on. Some of them have things that look like boats. A God looks like a boat. Can you believe that? And they put God beside that boat. They say, well, yeah, we'll just put him in here with, let's put him in the garage with God, the boat. Because they're both gods. We'll worship both of them. You know, we'll worship this one on Sunday and we'll worship this one on the rest of the week. Or some of them, they've made gods out of all kinds of things. Their homes, their yards. How many many excuses, let's see, in the years I've been a pastor, which is a long time, oh my gosh. How many excuses have I heard for people that can't serve God? Can you imagine how many excuses I've heard? I, I don't think you can come up with a new one. I bet I've heard them all. I think I have. Of why, I, I, I have something else I've got to do. I've got something else I've got. And it always seems like it just takes the place of what God wanted to do. Instead of serving the one true God, they just put God, the real God, alongside their other God. And see, now then, whenever they see the problem, they don't, want to, they don't want to bow down to the real God like their God was doing. They don't want to bow down to Him, no, because that would mean that they couldn't do what they want to do. As long as they have a do-nothing God, they can do anything they want to. But when the one true God shows up, all of a sudden, they feel conviction. They feel like, I've got, there's something God wants me to do. I'm one of his children, and I believe that and he wants me to do something. I don't like that. I like to do what I want to do. So they just leave him. They try to take him out of there. Let me serve that other God. Let me get rid of this God. And they try to do away with God. But you see, here's the problem. God is a real God. And God is a holy God. And God is a jealous God. And he will not allow us as his children to serve any other God. Even I've heard people that will make children their gods. I love children. I love my children. But nowhere in the scripture does it say that I'm supposed to make them equal with God. Nowhere. Nowhere. In fact, if I find a story, I found a story. Abraham, remember Abraham and Isaac? Remember that story? Abraham is given the son, Isaac, who is the, the promised son. God had promised him in his old age. He's 99 years old when this baby's born. And now he's about 12 years old. And God says, man, and he's called his only son, his dear son. He's talking about his son. And God says, you know, I'm afraid, Abraham, maybe you've made your son your God. You're worshiping him more than me. I, I think I'm going to test you. And so he comes to Abraham. He says, Abraham, take your son up to the mountain and sacrifice him. And Abraham <laughs> obediently does what God says. And you know the story. God didn't require the sacrifice, but God wanted to see that he loved him, loved God more than his own children. We love our children. But do not let them take the place of God. Don't let anybody, don't let your mate take the place of God. You know how much I love my wife. I love her with all my heart, but she's second place to God. And I am second place to God. That's the way it's supposed to be. Amen? 
Then these Philistines, they were handling the ark. The ark was a piece of furniture that God had given at the temple, and it was a special place because God had made that the place with the ark of the covenant, and it was the place where they would come and bring their atonement every year. It was the place where they put their blood sacrifice to take care of their sin every year. It was an important piece of furniture, but it was a piece of furniture, but it was an important piece of furniture. It meant something. It was the presence of God. It's what it showed. And when they saw the ark of the covenant, it reminded them of God's presence and his holiness. But now the Philistines had this ark. Well, the Philistines are unsaved. They, you can't expect them to know how to handle the ark, right? But God was very specific about the handling of the ark. They were supposed to handle it very, you weren't supposed to ever put it on a cart. It was supposed to be handled between the priest, and they had to use these special staves that went through it and picked it up. They weren't allowed to touch it. That's the way it was to be handled as a very holy object. And so they were not allowed. But now the Philistines have it. Well, the Philistines don't have all those laws. They don't understand all those rules. And I'll be honest with you, they're not taking care of it like they're supposed to. And they mishandled it, of course. But then they didn't know any better. And I got to thinking about that. I thought, well, how many things does God place holy in our lives that we don't handle properly? How many things has God given us as a child of God that we don't handle properly? We treat it very blandly. It's, it's, it's to say it. I don't know how else to say it. I thought about prayer. Prayer. God gave us access to the Father through Jesus Christ. He gave us that as part of our, 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 our gifts that we get because we're one of his children. We can access the Father anytime we want to. I can try to call my congressman. I can try to call the president. I can try to call the president of the SBC. And I can tell you, I will not get through the first time. But I can get hold of the God of the universe anytime I want to. All I have to do is bow my head and say, if I don't have to bow my head, all I have to do is say, Father, and I mean, he's right there listening, paying attention to me. What an awesome thing that God's given me as one of his children. Do I treat it properly? Probably not. Do I use it the way I should? Probably not. I'm kind of like these Philistines. I don't understand what I have because if I understood it, I'd recognize how special it is. I thought about the Bible. How many of us mishandled the use of the word of God? Some of you, you have your Bible with you today, and God bless you. I appreciate you bringing it to church. You should bring a Bible to church. I hope you need, you feel the importance of bringing it to church. And if you don't, I hope you get the one out of the pew and use it, but, because we're going to study the Word of God. But is that the only time you use it? You, you know, if, you, if the Bible is only used for you on Sunday mornings, can I tell you something I know about you? You're probably one of the weakest Christians walking the face of the planet. Because if you're not getting any more food than what you get here on Sunday mornings, you have got to be starving to death spiritually. You have got to learn to feed yourself. You've got to learn to take in the Word of God. But many of us don't realize how special the Word of God is. The Word of God is... There was a story this morning, Adrian Rogers related, I thought it was really good. He said there was a, a, a fellow who taught, I think, seventh, sixth or seventh grade, and... Um, he wanted to make, he was an atheist, he wanted to make sure all of his children understood that God was a fallacy, the Bible was of no value. And so the first day of school he goes in, and these little 12 year olds are all sitting around, he said, I want to know if there's any of you in here that believe the Bible is really the word of God. And he looks around, and all the kids are sitting there, they've heard how he is, and they won't raise their hands even though they're Christians, and finally this one little boy raised his hand and said, I do. And he said, you believe as the Bible is the word of God? He said, I sure do. He said, I don't know how in the world you can believe that. There's no, he said, I've read the Bible. He said, it's so full of discrepancies and, 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 and just all kinds of problems. He said, there's things that just don't relate. He said, I don't even know how you can even understand it. And you call that the Word of God? And the little boy said, teacher, he said, let me just tell you something. He said, the Bible is a love letter to the people who know God. He said, it's evidence you don't know him or you would understand it. I like that. But that's the Bible. What about the church? The church is important. You know God made the church for important. He made the church. He's the one that designed this thing. He's the one that brought it into existence at Pentecost. That's what he did. The church. It's called the church of Jesus Christ. It's referred to as the bride of Christ. You don't think that he doesn't think it's important? Why would he call it the bride of Christ if he didn't think it was important? And yet people would discard the church as if it's, oh, it's no, thing, no big deal. But it is a big deal. 
And if not the church, the church family. Man, I've been, I've been a part of this church for over 28 years, and I can tell you church family means a lot to me. Y'all have walked through me some of the darkest times. You've been there when I needed you, and I hope I've been there when you needed me. We, we, we are in this together. We're a family, amen? That doesn't mean we always get along. In fact, I found growing up, I didn't get along with my brothers very much at all, but you know what? It didn't matter because we were still family. And every night we'd have to sit around that dinner table and I'm going to tell you something. You may not get along with everybody in your church, but you better start trying because one of these days you're going to sit around the dinner table together. Amen? Well, they took, the, they took it from Ashdod to Gath to Ekron. Seven months, they treated the ark of God as if it was a hot potato. And the hand of God was heavy there, wherever it was. Now, let's look at chapter 6. Ooh, we're going to have to hurry. And the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and diviners, saying that, What shall we do to the ark of God? Tell us wherewith we shall send it to its place. How do we get rid of it? And they said, If we send away the ark of God of Israel, send it not empty, but in any wise return him a trespass offering, then he shall be healed, and it shall be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. Then said they, What shall the trespass offering which we shall return to him? And they answered, Five golden emrods. And five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines, for one plague was on you all and on your lords. Wherefore, you shall make images of your emeralds and images of your mice that mar the land. And you shall give glory unto the God of Israel. Peradventure, he will lighten his hand from off of you and from off your gods and from off your land. Wherefore, then do ye harden your hearts as the Egyptians, and the Pharaoh hardened his hearts. Then when he had wrought wonderfully among them, did they not let the people go? And they departed. Now therefore make a new cart and take two milk kine, that's two cows. And those are actually cows with calves. On which there hath come no yoke. And tie the kine to the cart and bring their calves home from them. And take the ark of the Lord and lay it upon the cart and put jewels of gold which you return him for a trespass offering in a coffer by the side thereof and send it away that it may go. And see if it goeth up by the way of his own coast to Beth Shemesh. Then he hath done us, then he hath done us this great evil. But if not, then we know... We shall know that it is not his hand that smote us. It was a chance that happened to us. And as the man did so, he took the two milk kine and tied them to the cart and shut up the calves at home. And they laid the ark of the Lord upon the cart and the coffer with the mice and the gold and the images of the emeralds. And the kine took straight way to the way of Beth Shemesh and went along the highway, lowing as they went and turning not aside to the right or and left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them under the border of Beth Shemesh. And they of Bethshemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. And they lifted up their eyes and they saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. So here's what happened. It's kind of interesting. They took these two cows. Now, these cows had calves. And they took the calves and they took the calves away from the mothers and put them back in the house, back in the, in the yard, away from the mamas. Now, if you know anything about mama cows, you don't mess with their babies. Amen. Because they want to be there where the babies are. And when those little calves start baying, what's going to happen is mama cow's going to go find that baby calf. That's just going to happen. Well, they tie them to this, cat, this cart, and they say, you turn that cart loose, and if that cart goes straight on to Beth Shemesh, you'll know that God is the one that brought this on us. But if it turns aside, and they thinking in their head, they surely turn aside because those little calves are going to be baying, and that mother calf's go, cow's going to want to turn. But when they turned them loose, those mama cows went straight to Beth Shemesh mooing all the time, it said, because of their babies back yonder. But they had to do what God told them to do. They took it back to Beshemus. Now, I want to just talk to you about these golden objects for a second. They said, we want to get rid of the ark. What should we do? And their, their leader said, tell you what, fill it full of your stuff, and then they'll receive it. If you'll fill it full of your stuff, all that stuff you think is so valuable... You know, the gold and stuff. Make it look like the emeralds, which are the little tumors. Make it look like the little tumors and the little mice that are infecting the land. Make it look like that and send it by them. Just send those gold things. Oh, they'll take it because, you know, people like gold and they'll understand. You're trying to do what's right. Put it on a new cart and put jewels all around it. You know, the world thinks that if they give us the things of the world that interest us, that in some way that we're going to be ready to receive it. You know, it shouldn't be that way. 
Now, I'm going to give you a great example, but you're not going to like it. I'm going to tell you you're not going to like it at all. But I have an I have a, I have a, uh, explanation of how to fix it. But I, I tell you something that bothers me. You ever drive by the ballparks on Saturdays? You know what I find? Very few things going on on Saturdays. Drive by there this morning and see what's going on. You know, when I was growing up, you didn't play baseball on Sundays, and you didn't play baseball on Wednesday nights. But now we do. And, and what's happened is they've taken, and, and here's what they do. They say, but listen, don't worry, preacher, because before we play, we pray. You know what they just did? They put all the gold stuff around it to make me think it's okay. But the truth is it's not okay. Those children need to be in church. They need to be in Sunday school. They need to be taught the Word of God. Now, you say, preacher, you're getting off on some stuff that really getting close to home. I know. I've got to. But I want to tell you something. If some men of God would finally stand up and say, you know what? My, my boys, my girls, they're not going to play ball on Sundays and Wednesday nights. And if I have to, I'll farm my own league so that they don't have to. Because they don't have to. Boy, I hate it. Y'all get so quiet. I wish it was true about everything. If there's an activity on Sunday, it seems like the first, first right out of the box, we'll drop church, we'll drop Sunday school, we'll drop whatever the kids would usually do, and we'll take them to that activity. Make Saturday your activity day. You know, let Sunday be God's day. Let your children grow up understanding that God's important in your household and that He doesn't take second rate. He doesn't stand aside. It doesn't matter how many times they pray. It doesn't matter if they have a Bible study before baseball game. If they're playing on Sunday, they ought to be in their own church. They ought to be serving God in their own church. And their mom and dad ought to be there with them serserving God. Ooh, I'll hear no end of that one. It just shouldn't be that way. You know, it's like putting lipstick on a pig. Amen. Have y'all ever kissed a pig? Well, I won't get off on that. I'm going to leave that one alone. <laughs> it don't matter how much lipstick you put on that pig. It's still a pig. Amen. The ark to the Philistines was just nothing but a spoil of battle. The Philistines looked at that. It's just a piece of furniture. It's something they hauled around. But when they got it, all of a sudden they realized they got something that they didn't realize. To the Israel, it had become an idol. It had become the thing of worship. They began to worship the furniture instead of the Savior. For God, it was a representation of His presence, which means holiness, and it should have been treated with some kind of reverence, but it wasn't. The ark was in possession of the Philistines because Israel had chose it over God for their deliverance. They chose a symbol instead of the Savior. Now, God's going to bring the ark back by His own way. And the Philistines acting out of ignorance has done a lot of things, but now we see the people of God should have known better. Let's look down at verse 14. Is that where I stop? 14. And the cart came into the field of Joshua, Beshemite, and stood there where there was a great stone. And they claved the wood of the cart and offered the kind a burnt offering to the Lord. And the Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the coffer that was in it, wherein the jewels and gold were, and put them on a great stone. And the men of Beshemish offered burnt offerings and sacrifices the same day in the Lord. Now let me just say this about that. They did exactly what they should have done. They, got, they did right. They saw this ark sitting on this cart and they said, that's not right. The Levites come who are the ones who are supposed to handle the ark and they were the right ones and they took possession of the ark and they took it off the cart and they took the cart and they broke it into pieces and they made a fire out of it. And then they took the two cows that had brought it and they offered them for a sacrifice. This is exactly what they should have done. And the Levites now have possession of the ark and they should have known that that was all they needed to do. But wait a minute, on that ark, beside the ark, there was this little coffin, this little uh, basket full of all kinds of little gold items. And somehow or another, their little minds went to wondering. Now, you don't find this in Scripture. I'm giving you something here that I see that I hadn't seen before. But they look at that and they say, hmm, if God gave that to us here, wonder if there's something more God wants us to have. Verse goes on, it says, And when the five lords, it explains the five lords of Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. And these are the golden emeralds which the Philistines returned for a trespass offering the Lord for Ashdod one, for Gaza one, for Ash, Ash, Ashkelon one, and for Gath one, and for Ekron one. 
And the golden mice, according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines, belonging to five lords, both the fenced cities and the country and villages, even under the great stone of Abel, wherein they set down the ark of God of the Lord, which stone remaineth unto this day in the field of Joshua the Beshemite. Now watch this. And he smote the men of Beshemesh. Why? Because they had looked into the ark of God. Even he smote of the people 50,000 threescore and ten men. And the people lamented because the Lord had smitten many of the people with great slaughter. They had done what was right. When they saw the ark on the cart, they took it off. The Levites took possession. They destroyed the cart. They sacrificed the kind, the cows. That was exactly what they should do. They've done well up to this point. But all of a sudden now, they decide, you know what? You reckon maybe they put something else in this ark? Let's take a look. Knowing that God had forbidden that, inside the ark is the law. Inside the ark is the law and a pot of manna and Aaron's rod. And that's all that's in there. And the law is in there. And they open that ark, they take the mercy seat off, and they expose themselves to the law, and the law destroys man. And that's a picture that we see there. They open the ark completely against what God wants them to do, and God kills 50,070 people right then. 50,070. But they learn their lesson. Look at the last verse, verse 20. It says, The men of Bethlehem said, who is able to stand before this holy Lord God? And to whom shall he go up from us? They understood they had violated the holiness of God. They understood that what, what they had done is violate God's law. And because of that, they suffered. They didn't ask why. They knew why. They knew why those people died. They knew why God would judge them like that. But now, they, as they recognize, they said, how, how, who is able to stand before a holy Lord God? My lesson this morning is very, very simple. As we consider what we've just read, one is, where's your God? Where do you keep your God? Is he first place or second place or third place? Does he take preeminence in your life or is he just part of your life? Is he who you live for? Is he in control? Is he the one that is, is in charge of your life? Or is he the one that you kind of set aside and say, you need to leave me alone? Uh, you, you know, I, I've, got, I've got other things to do. I, I've got other gods to serve. I, I've got, you know, you can't take complete control. I, I've got other things I want to do. Maybe that's you. But in the end, you're going to have to answer the question, is God holy in your life? Because this is where it came to. They began to realize God is holy. In fact, the Bible says he's thrice, thrice holy, 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 holy. That means he's the holiest of all. He's completely holy, and he's just, and he, de and he, and he requires or he, he, he deserves our worship and our commitment to him. We need to give our hearts and lives to him completely and wholly. Amen? Let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you for this morning. Lord, I know that I've touched on some things that are very sensitive. Lord, not in any way to try to uh, hurt or, or damage or limit anybody. But, Father, that we might recognize how far we move away from you when we start moving. How we never get stuck. We never get stopped. We, we start with one thing and it leads to another and then another and then another. And before long, we're so far removed from you, we can't hardly really find you anymore. And Lord, this morning, I believe you're calling us back to holiness. You're calling us back to live as children of God, to be who you called us to be. Lord, I pray this morning as we consider our own hearts in this very moment that we'd look at our hearts and find, where is God in my heart? Where does he sit? Where does he stand? How much of my heart does he have? What things do I allow to enter into my life that take precedent over him, over his work, over his word? over his love for me and my family. What things do I put in the way of that? Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And just for a few moments, let's just have a time just for you to think about that question. How, where is your God this morning? Where is he? How much of your life does he own? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Let's stand to our feet. Miss Charlotte's going to play two verses of a song. If no one comes, we'll close. But if you come, if you need some help,
you need somebody to pray with you, I'll be here. Or if you want to just use the altar, you can do that. But I, I challenge you, will you ask yourself, what does my holiness look like? What, is, what does my life look like? Is God in control? Does the God, the holiness of God, is this one true God, the holy God of Israel, is he in charge of my life or have I given it over to something else? And if you have, why don't you start today and say, no more, no more. I don't know how I'm going to change it, but no more. I'm going to put God first. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed as she begins to play. You do what God wants you to do right now. Heavenly Father, we love you and thank you so much because you love us. You never give up on us. We fail you, you pick us up. We walk away from you, you run us down. Many times, Father, you bring us back to a, a ring that says we're your own. We don't even deserve that. We thank you, Lord, for grace that allows us the opportunity to walk with you, talk with you, visit with you, share with you, be called your own because of your grace that you give us, not because we don't deserve it. We thank you, God, that you love us because of that. I pray, Father, today that you'll allow us to walk in that grace.